Great. Well, welcome. Uh, come in. Uh, take a seat. And um, we're thrilled to have everybody here. My name is Gary Swart. I'm a venture capitalist at a company called Polaris Partners. We uh, invest, uh, been around for about 20 years. We invest in healthcare and technology companies, um, manage about four and a half billion dollars. And prior to this, I ran a marketplace by the name of Odesk, which merged with Elance, became Upwork. And uh, I think you know the rest of that story. Hopefully you do. But we're not here to talk about me. We're here to talk about uh, Melody and Style Seat. Uh, so just before we get started, quick show of hands, how many people in the audience are entrepreneurs or uh, founders? Great. Okay, so you're in the right place because you're going to uh, learn from, uh, from one of the best. So before we dive into the product market fit, which is what we're here to talk about, tell us the founder story. Why Style Seat? What was the, what was the aha moment for you? Why this of all the things you could be doing? And then how's the company doing? Sure. Um, I was obsessed with the idea of Style Seat for actually several years before I started the company. And it was this little kind of bug in my ear where anytime I would have a little bit of free time, I'd like run to a notebook and sort of sketch out how a particular part of the product would work or how, um, f uh, how we would make money, how we would sort of accelerate the connections between supply and demand uh, among beauty professionals. Um, I was not a beauty professional and actually I don't have a creative bone in my body, I think. I wish that I did. Um, but I very much admire hairstylists and they, you know, you guys probably have a great relationship with your stylist or barber. They can be your counselor. Um, they are not only really talented at what they do, but there's such a loving energy that they give to their work. Um, and I love professionals that do that because it's so different than my professional experience, right? I come from tech, I'd worked in product uh, and working with software engineers. And so the idea of working with creatives was so fun and creating a product for um, especially entrepreneurs. And it started when I would have conversations with whether they were salon owners or independent professionals or employees. And I would hear these stories about how they were so passionate about their work and they were doing this and supporting their families. Most of them are women but they didn't know how to make their clients come back more often, or they didn't know how to do a client newsletter, or they didn't know how to, you know, uh, and this was back before Instagram, and so they said, how do I create a website? Do I have to pay a developer a couple of thousand do uh, thousands of dollars in order to get a website? It's so intimidating. And the challenges that they had were challenges that I thought would be really fun to solve, and if I was going to work for a customer, I wanted to work for mostly women. I wanted to work for independent contractors and definitely creatives. So that's, that's kind of how it started. And how long have you been at it? When did you? We did launched in 2011. So before. I've been at it for a while. Yeah. So um, lesson number one is marketplaces take time. They take, well they take yeah. a minute. It's yep. true. And uh, where's the business today? So just give us an idea of scope. How many clients, how many customers? Uh, give us some of your key metrics. Sure. Um, we have tens of millions of clients. We have powered over 100 million appointments across our platform. It's totaled over $5 billion in revenue for our small businesses, which we're very proud of. Um, and we've grown almost entirely via word of mouth, which is also something that we're proud of. So stylists um, will sign up. We double their revenue in the first year of being on the platform. They love that. They tell other stylists who also sign up themselves. Um, and that's really how our virtuous cycle works. We make their clients come back more frequently. We make the money. We save the money. Um, and that, for them, the fact that we solve all of their core business needs is a really big deal and, and has been our biggest growth factor. Uh, m word of mouth, but you've also done amazingly well on PR. There's probably a lesson there as well. Like, I was always envious really? of how you, oh, I thought you, you were great at uh, writing a good story and getting it out there. You have no concept of that as a founder, yeah. you know, because for me, I'm like, I want this many hits a month. Like I want PR to really be performant and that's not really how it works. And so I feel like I'm always unhappy with PR. Um, and I don't know, I, I always struggle with that one a little bit, but. So um, we're here to talk about product market fit. So you saw this need in the market and the need mm -hmm. was uh, born of stylists not being able to sort of manage their back office, handle the complexity of the business, let them do what they're really good at, which is the creative aspect, but how are they gonna manage their business? Was that the, the painkiller, or was that the, the migraine headache that you saw? Or? Yeah, what's really interesting is when I started the company, 80% of professionals were actually employees at salons, which means they would show up, 
into the salon, cut hair, go home. The salon would manage all of the other business operations, and they would have to pay that salon 60% and sometimes more of their revenue throughout the day. And that was just to rent the chair or for, for, for them For the honor of working the... at the salon, okay. essentially. Yeah. Um, and the salon would say, it's because we're working on your marketing for you and we're making clients come back. Um, but most of that work was being done just by a receptionist who was accepting incoming bookings. Um, salons aren't very good at CRM, and they're not very good at sort of sophisticated business types of of tools. And so our first product actually was a client tracking tool. So it was an app that a stylist could, even if they were an employee, they could hand to a client that was in the chair and they could say, we gave them guidance on how to do this. They could say, hey, enter in your contact information. And if I have specials coming up, I'll let you know. Um, and it, it was a way for them to own their own book of business, own their own clients, so that if they decided to move, right, and become independent uh, professionals, they could actually do that and they could um, continue those client relationships. Which is probably, I mean, that's really what it is. You go to a person, you don't really go to a salon. You don't walk in and say, give me anybody. You go back to the person. That's exactly right. Okay, that's exactly it. right. But discovery didn't work that way. Yeah. Um, especially back in the day because the salons... Uh, would not really want you to know very much information about the stylists that worked there. They wanted that asymmetry of information. And so by providing that clarity of here are all the different professionals, here are their ratings, here's photos of their work for the particular service you're looking for, here's their cost, um, here's how to reach them, that clarity was hugely beneficial for clients. And what was interesting dynamic for us is that on average, a professional adds 200 clients into their style seat platform. Um, those clients, 50% of those clients become Style Seat users within the first couple of weeks because booking on Style Seat is easier than trying to call your stylist during office hours. Um, so we were seeing that supply was actually driving demand for us. And then we were able to increase the frequency of that client and also um, found ways to help that client get more services from that professional and ultimately pay more to that professional. Um, and pros would see that, and that was hugely valuable for them because it allowed them to go back to focusing on what they love, which is being an artist and working with clients, um, and we would take on business stuff. So when I started the business, 80% of professionals were um, uh, employees at salons, and today 70% are independent contractors in the market. Wow, so the market's shifted, and yes. you, you probably had something to do with that movement, but prior, like to to, so. prior to that, they couldn't. So your first product added value for the practitioner, mm -hmm. gave them uh, an opportunity to own their book of business. And yes. so that was product one. And t talk to us about product market fit there. And yeah. now you've built this great product. You've got it. You've got a need, a migraine headache that exists. You found a solution to it, but now you actually have to get it into people's hands yeah. and get them to use it. So talk about that. So I threw a, an event in South Park. One of those VC firms used to be a hair salon. And at that salon, I, I basically spammed all my friends and said, give me, if you know your email address for your stylist, send it to me, please. Um, and I sent out a fancy invite and said, champagne mixer for top stylists in San Francisco. Um, and I went to Costco and I bought a bunch of really cheap, like not even champagne. It was like sparkling wine and like ripped off the labels and um, cooked a bunch of fancy food and let, it, let them mingle and then gave them a PowerPoint presentation on look, this is, this is the situation. This is what's happening in the industry. This isn't really fair. I want to empower professionals. Will you work with me to make that happen? Um, and I don't know if it was that talk or that presentation or the cheap fizzy wine that got them to commit to downloading our um, terrible at the time app. Uh, but what was nice about that is along the way, they would help us. Like we really had a customer base that was very engaged and excited about what we were doing. And so, um, they would help us make it better, but it also really started to spread like wildfire. And so we were a client tracking app, and then we started to add on CRM and then backend scheduling, and then we added websites on top of that. And then we connected all of the websites together and added search, uh, and that's when we launched stylesheet.com. And so you had one side of the market at this point. You had stylists, but you didn't really have customers. So it's a little bit open table, like you need restaurants before you can get diners. Yep. You needed stylists before you can get, uh, before you can get Clients, clients, right? Yep, so that's exactly talk right. about that. So you had the you had one side of the marketplace. Yep. You faked the chicken, if you will. Yeah. And were you monetizing that, or that was not in the beginning? Yeah. Um, because we wanted to really understand um, what where we would monetize, and we didn't want to kind of nickel and dime them for a product that didn't quite solve all of their business needs. Um, so we found that stylists overwhelmingly through all the product research that we did. 
yes, they needed CRM, but yes, they also needed client tracking and they needed a website and they needed online booking. And really until we could solve a number of those needs and just kind of like fix their business problems, they, they still had to use us and something else. Um, and so we wanted to stay free and kind of a no brainer until we could really justify paying a fee for a customer that doesn't have a ton of disposable income and isn't spending a lot of money on business tools. And so we started with that. Um, and we were free for a while and the growth was so crazy that we were doing um, almost $2 billion a year in bookings across our platform entirely organically. And we had a team of like 20 people and only like six of them are engineers or something like that. So you can imagine the duct tape and string and hopes and dreams that we had put into our platform just to make sure it didn't go down. Um, and, and that the money was very go- challenging. The money wasn't going through your platform. Zero revenue. You're talking about $2 billion in GMV yes. in total appointments booked. Yes. And you knew that because you know how much a stylist charges. Yes. You know that they're booking an hour. Therefore, you can yes. come up with the GMV. Yeah. So now you've got this platform going. Now you, you have to get clients. Mm-hmm. And so... Well, what's interesting is we had clients. Okay, because they brought their clients. So right. we were a utility for clients to book with their existing professional. And what we found is that clients will actually kind of go wherever their pro is, and they'll kind of use whatever crappy solution their pro says, or they'll just call the salon. And in either case, even when clients called the salon, we because we were their operating system essentially for their business... Um, we didn't really mind either way. And what we had to do, the trick to sort of build our virtuous cycle um, was to make sure that it was easier and better for the client to use style seat than it was to use any other method. Mm. Um, and so that's where it was a really challenging position, honestly, for the business because we had supply and a couple of different supply segments. We had demand in a couple of different demand segments. And it was hard for us to filter as a company of like very small scrappy team with this insane amount of volume that we were seeing. It was hard for us to filter where we spend our time. And this is where I think a lot of marketplaces have run into trouble and why a lot of them go out of business is because you have to have a really strong philosophy and a very clear one side of the market that you deeply focus on in order to be successful. Otherwise, you're going to sort of peanut butter and be spread too thin and be not very valuable to everybody. And so you've always been stylist first. Well, I mean, I, mean I, I would love to say that, but that's not true. I wish it was true. Yeah. Uh, we didn't know, right? And this is kind of the early days of marketplaces as well. So we were supporting supply and demand and we were spread too thin. And that was a really important moment of realization for me when I realized, all right, we really have to pick a side and we have to monetize. And for me as a founder, I was deeply scared of that moment because I didn't know if the day we turn on that paywall, if I wouldn't have a business the next day. Like I had no idea. Um, And there were still a lot of issues with our software, right? It was was a very scary moment. And uh, I had to basically like, I think I was drinking wine in the middle of our conference room, like at two in the morning, like really like lying on the floor, trying to decide like, do we flip the switch or not? Do we flip the switch? Finally, I'm like, look, you know, we've been doing this for a while. We have such high volume that if we flip a switch and no one stays with us, then we have a pretend company anyway. So I'd rather know that sooner than later, frankly. Yeah. Um, and we did, and we became profitable right away, which was bomb. And what was more important (laughs) than that for us is that it gave us a very clear lens of who our customer is and how we prioritize improving that experience for them because our customer is the person paying us, end of story. Um, And that brought a lot of clarity and a lot of calmness. You know, before the company was a little bit frenetic because we wanted to be all things to all people. And then it became very, very clear. And that united the entire team and allowed us to build better product more quickly. Yeah, I, we had many of these moments at Odesk, I, and I used to say I'd rather burn out than fade away. Like you can continue down this path for a while, but wouldn't you rather hit the wall so you know you totally w- what to do? So I think the way you put it is really great. So, so how do you monetize? So what's the monetization? And, and it was just a smooth sailing from there. Oh yeah, there, smooth or? sailing, super yeah. easy. Uh, you guys know this. Marketplaces are fun. Um, I'm just kidding. They are fun. They're just a lot. Um, We monetize in a couple of ways. So we charge a $35 monthly fee for our professionals to get access to the platform. So they get a free trial, but then they have to pay us um, or not. And then we charge a 2.75% transaction fee. And there are also other ways that we're um, monetizing, experimenting with monetizing, but we haven't publicly rolled them out yet. So 
you evolved to transaction fees. So you're in the money loop now. Yeah. So you collect the money for them, which is great, right? Because that way they don't have to worry about, I don't have the cash, I forgot yeah. the credit card. It's, well, it's interesting. So it's very great because it allows us not only to uh, obviously increase our, increase our lifetime value and increase our um, investment into value for our community, but it also allows us to provide superior economics to our professional, right? So we always want to, like the lens for product for us is we want pros to use us more and for more things. Um, and the more you use us and for more things, the, the, the better we want the experience to be for you and the better we want um, the experience to be for your clients as well. Excellent. So um, uh, the products evolved quite a bit. And uh, so now you've got this SaaS model where they're paying a subscription fee plus a transaction fee. And mm -hmm. where do you go from here? Now, now what happens? Uh, you know, there's very interesting things that are happening in other industries and with other marketplaces that are very interesting for the beauty industry. Um, you can think about discovery and how that has completely transformed and changed. Um, search used to be a really big deal and now we're starting to see social be a really big deal. Um, a lot of people use Instagram to find their professional, which we find to be very interesting. Uh, we also know that services, uh, the way the industry works, I would say, is very pen and paper in terms of the economics, and we really want to change that. We believe there's a big opportunity to make stylists a lot more money and to make clients a lot happier. You can imagine times maybe when you might be willing to spend more for an appointment or you might be willing to get an extra service or a couple of services done if there's an extra little incentive. And so we think about that a lot. We do a lot of research around that, and we're going to be rolling out some cool things soon. So you've mentioned uh, wine a couple of times, wine, champagne. You've mentioned how hard it is. I know that you just had a baby. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank so you. is this your forever job? I mean, you, you know, you've been at this eight years. Yeah. You know, how do you, how far do you take it? And, you know, what, how do you, how do you think about? I don't know if it's a strength or a downfall that I deeply love operating. I, if there isn't a super hard problem to solve where I can like run into a conference room and just you know, either pull a couple people in with me and like whiteboard or, you know, shut the curtains and like lie on the floor and like think about a problem deeply. I do that um, a lot. I love it. Um, and so I'm sort of doing it until it's not fun anymore. But so far that hasn't happened. I kind of, I joke with um, like my board members and investors. I'm like, I'm sort of like a cockroach. Like you can't kill me. Like I'll still be around because I just love, I love being here. I love solving problems. I love operating. Um, and so that's, I don't know. It hasn't gotten boring yet. And speaking of board, um, speaking with your board and, and the like, you made some board changes. So you had, uh, you were right up on the edge of this hashtag me too. One of your investors was involved and you had to swap them out and you replaced with Travis, which could also be somewhat controversial, despite mm -hmm. the fact he knows a ton about marketplaces. Talk about that. And so I made two, yeah. two changes yeah. to the board. Um, and this is, this stemmed from focusing on the needs of the business, right? So uh, earlier in the business, I had all investors on my board. And I think this is common um, or fairly common, I think. And the benefit of that is that you have a, be a, a certain perspective, which is folks sitting around the table helping you think about your next round, um, which is very important, right? Capital is actually the number, the most important thing, keeping the lights on um, that a founder can think about. But uh, as a company evolves, and you're less concerned about keeping the lights on, you then become more concerned about how do, I, how do I build the right things? How do I prioritize the right things? How do I make sure I'm making the, the right short-term versus long-term investments? And for me, those types of decisions were best um, discussed with operators. So we made some changes on our board where um, we swapped out a handful of investors with operators. So I brought on, actually replaced that investor with Melissa Kim, who's the co-founder of Minted. She's a total badass. Um, I think Miriam, her co-founder is speaking at this conference, but uh, they're both incredible. And then I brought on Travis as well, who knows a little bit about marketplaces and growth. I remember speaking with you when you were going early days, how, and how valuable. We had great conversations yeah, about yeah. Uh, many of the operational challenges. So along those lines, what advice would you give to the founders here on 
I don't know, maybe like one of the mistakes you made in product market fit or one of the valuable things, like help them avoid a pitfall that you experienced firsthand. What advice would you give them? You know what? I think, and I don't know if it was a self-confidence thing for me in the beginning of running my business or because it was my first company that I was running, but I was very open to opinions. I was very open to advice and advice was constantly thrown my way. And it's not to say that advice isn't great, especially from very smart people, especially from people that have highly relevant experience. But I, what I realized later is a couple of the biggest mistakes that we made were sort of either from outside parties that were just trying to draw comparisons to other marketplaces, many of which ended up going away, um, uh, or they just didn't, they weren't as close to my customer as I was. And I've lived and breathed my customer, I talk to professionals like seven, seven times a week. I absolutely love our professionals and I love clients um, and I love understanding the experiences and trying to make it better. And at the end of the day, no one knows that more than I do. And I think realizing that and having confidence in that um, and being really transparent about decision making and taking a lot of inputs in, but ultimately making the decision myself was something I had to learn over time. So trusting your own instincts, but also knowing your customer exceptionally well, knowing, yeah. the, knowing the, the pain that they're experiencing. You know, the challenge with that is that there's so many things that you can do, and there's only so much time and resources that you have to do them. So yeah. it's the prioritization of those things. So how do you decide what's the most important <laughs> thing? Is that a gut feel or is that data or like, you how know, do you prioritize? It's, it's, so I would say 90% of my decisions are data driven and 10% are gut based on zero data. And I like to be transparent about when I'm making one type of decision versus the other. Um, you know, I usually start with a business objective. So I've been very clear with my board and my investors, you know, I want to build a big business. I'm looking not just for a niche little cute uh, company. I want to build a big business. I want to power a lot of this industry. I want to have a huge impact for you know, we have 75% of our customers are women that are supporting their families. 50% are people of color. They're mostly in the South and the Midwest. We're talking about real Americans. I take that seriously. I want to support as many uh, people as we can to help them double their revenue. And so, so we start with that and, and really get alignment around that. But then there's always a business objective and sort of things that you need to prove as a business before you can move on to the next. And once you make that very clear, once I've made that very clear to my team, then the sort of details and the top down, bottom up sizing and sort of vetting, well, which one of these things will be able to help us best hit our objective as opposed to another becomes a lot more clear and transparent. Um, and that can be negotiation often based on data. I think that's great guidance. Clarity as to what's the most important metric. For us at Odesk, we grew so fast, we lost sight of quality. And so that became very quickly our number one thing. It was make a great match every time. And the way to determine whether or not you had a great match was, was it a successful outcome? Mm -hmm. If you didn't have a successful outcome, nothing else mattered because yep. they weren't going to repeat. They weren't going to tell friends how great it was. Didn't matter how many marketing dollars you spent if you didn't have a successful match. So that became prioritization of product pretty quickly was determined based on that metric. And when everyone has that North Star, it's like, even if you're, even if you know it, the 10 decisions you make a week, the important ones or a month as a leader are clear to you. But if your whole team doesn't know it, that means the 10 decisions every single person at your company are making, which have exponential impact and oftentimes more than the decisions you're making, um, they can be misaligned. And so that clarity is something that I didn't, I'm like, how many times do I have to talk about the mission, the vision, et cetera, when I was younger and stupider, right, as a CEO? Um, I'd be like, gosh, aren't people sick of it? And the reality is you can't talk about that stuff enough. You can't unify or make your vision and your mission clear enough to your team. It's always circling back. Um, and it makes people happy. It makes them uh, you know, understand how, what they're doing and how it fits into your overall picture. I remember I sent a, a climate survey once to see how we were doing. And I, one of the questions was, do we have a clear and inspiring vision? And some of the team came back and said, no, we don't. And I was like, well, which one is it? Is it not clear or not inspiring? And how could it not be clear? Because every time I stand yeah. in front of the company, I say the same thing. Every email says the same thing. So I completely agree. You know what's Can't interesting, say it though, enough. is like, um, as a founder, I am always thinking about CEO rather, where we are, where we were, where we're going, how it all fits together and constantly prioritizing the next step. But you think about 
the person who has life cycle marketing, not necessarily thinking about that. And so those, even though you feel like you're saying it over and over and you're saying it every meeting, you're thinking about it all day, every day, your operators, and especially sort of the, you know, the, the mid tier of your company aren't necessarily. And so you really can't circle back to that enough. Well, I am uh, so apologetic. I can't, I'm getting so old. I can't see the signs back there. This one says time's up. So we don't have time for questions. So my, oh. my deepest apologies. I, w I thought we had five minutes for questions. So uh, you're here for a little while. Maybe people can grab you in the Happy hall. But to. Thank you so much. Thank really you. Really great. Yeah, appreciate it. So nice to see you. Yeah, yeah. you as well. Thank awesome. you.